With the country on lockdown as Easter approaches, Catholic dioceses are suspending worship. Moral theologian Dr. Janet Smith shares her efforts to get the U.S. bishops to restore the sacraments. And an Oklahoma priest, Father Stephen Hamilton, has an innovative solution which he's already implemented in his own parish. Wisconsin Congressman Brian Stile is here to reveal the outrageous waste in the coronavirus stimulus package and what he plans to do about it. A battle over abortion is being waged in Louisiana as a clinic defies a state order to suspend non-emergency services during the pandemic. Attorney Angie Thomas is here with details. With three quarters of the country on lockdown, is our mental health endangered and what can we do about it? Dr. Meg Meeker is here with some timely advice. The World Over begins right now. I'm Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. As our global confinement continues, we're grateful to be with you. We have an hour of news, inspiration, information you really need. Janet Smith, Father Stephen Hamilton, Congressman Brian Stile, Angie Thompson, and Dr. Meg Meeker are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Lots to cover. First, some news on Monday. Cardinal Angelo de Don Datis, the Pope's Vicar for the Diocese of Rome became the highest ranking Catholic official known to test positive for coronavirus. De Donati's office said he was tested for the virus after feeling unwell and was admitted to a Rome hospital. His closest aides have gone into voluntary quarantine as a precaution. The Pope is the actual Bishop of Rome, but appoints someone to act as his vicar to administrate the vast diocese. De Donati's who is 66, is not believed to have had personal contact with Pope Francis recently. The Vatican said on Saturday that the Pope and his closest aides did not have the virus. At least 60 priests have died in Italy due to the coronavirus. A total of 13,115 people in Italy have succumbed to the effects of this plague, about a third of the deaths around the world. On March 25th, Italian Bishop Angelo Moreschi became the first bishop to perish after contracting the coronavirus. And the beloved pastor of a New York City church has become the first Catholic priest in the United States to die from the virus. Father Jorge Ortiz Garay served as a pastor of St. Bridget's Church in Brooklyn. He died in a hospital on Friday. Bishop Nicholas de Marzio said, quote, this is a sad time and a tremendous loss for the Diocese of Brooklyn. Father Jorge was a Great priest, beloved by the Mexican people, and a tireless worker for all the faithful in Brooklyn and Queens, end quote. Father Jorge was born in Mexico City. He became a priest in the U.S. after working as a lawyer. He was just 49 years old. The coronavirus has killed 1,200 New Yorkers, which has become the U.S. epicenter of the disease with a growing surge of cases. And more sad news from Africa, Cardinal Philippe Wedrago of Burkina Faso was tested positive for the coronavirus. Wedrago, who is 75, is said to be in good condition and his close collaborators are self-isolating. The cardinal is president of the African Continental Bishops' Conference. He's been Archbishop of Burkina Faso for 10 years. That country was the largest coronavirus outbreak in West Africa, with 249 documented cases as of March 31st. The coronavirus has spread throughout the African continent to 47 countries. Mm. Back here in the U.S., with more of the country under stay-at-home orders, Catholic dioceses have suspended masses and other sacraments to comply with government orders all days before Holy Week. But is the forced suspension of Catholic worship just, or is it a violation of the Constitution's guarantee of religious expression? My first guest is a moral theologian who believes the U.S. bishops should resist the orders to close their churches. She and other prominent Catholics have joined together in an open letter urging Catholic bishops to restore the sacraments to the faithful who need them, particularly now. 
Joining me is retired professor of moral theology at Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit, Michigan, Dr. Janet Smith. Dr. Smith, uh, I've been very concerned about the religious liberty implications here. I mean, at times, as in 9-11, we cede liberties to the government that we, we never get back. Are you worried that the rush to protect people from this virus, in the doing, they might be trading a cherished American right to religious expression? Well, I, I am, of course. And I think that if unless the bishops make a really strong stand that these are essential services, religion is not mm -hmm. just something like um, football games on Sunday afternoon. All right, and and mm -hmm. taking the blessed sacrament or taking the anointing of the sick to someone who is is dying in the hospital is not like taking roses. All right, this is an essential thing uh, to to Catholic people. This is practicing our faith, and so we're not just giving up something that is optional. It's absolutely necessary mm -hmm. to our spiritual faith. Yet we we can suspend things for for serious reasons, but sure. Uh, we, we, we just doing it, and it seems to be a bit cavalierly. Uh, the bishops, I heard of a bishop recently who was talking to his priests, and one priest wanted to hold a, a mass in a parking lot. Everybody goes in their car. Everybody stays in their car. There's virtually no possibility of spreading the virus. Zilch. None. Mm -hmm. And uh, the bishop said no. And the reason he said no was he wasn't certain that it, it didn't violate the state directive that there can't be large public gatherings. And I asked, did mm. he call and ask? All right, did he call and ask? <laughs> Why just yeah. accept? Well, where are, you know, uh, Dr. Smith, I wonder, what, the, 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 every one of these conferences have lawyers at their behest. They have a, a, you know, a team of lawyers that deal with all manner of things. Why can't the lawyers remind the bishops, you have a First Amendment right here. You have a, a, a right to religious expression. The, the, I mean, the, the, and if you look closely at these statutes that are being passed in the states and the bans being passed, in some of them, in Texas, in Florida, there are carve-outs and they're saying churches are essential services. So they're giving the bishops and the priests the leeway and the pastors the leeway to do something that's creative here. Now, you've spearheaded a national campaign urging all the U.S. bishops to restore the sacraments to the faithful after they were abruptly cut off because of this pandemic. Is this responsible, given the spread of the coronavirus? Yeah. Well, we don't intend to, to violate any of the public directives. We think it all can be done with full respect for the public directives. We don't want to put anybody at risk, all right? And, mm -hmm. and we don't even want to put them at much risk, as at much risk as is the typical grocery store clerk. They're at tremendous risk. They're not at six feet from anybody. All right, they're touching this, they're touching that. Everybody else is putting their card in and out. We want people to go to a parking lot in their cars and stay in their cars. How is this mm -hmm. a risk? People are, are, are giving confession. They're definitely six, six, eight feet away from a priest who's hearing their confession. This is fully in accord with all directives. So why are we suspending yeah. things that we're not, I mean, abortion clinics are still operating, um, liquor stores are still operating. Uh, why can't mm -hmm. churches be, why can't people go in? We can stay six feet apart. We can have people just like they're, they are sanitizing um, restaurants and sanitizing grocery stores. We can do all well, of that. Yeah, a, a piece of it, it seems to me, is, and maybe the bishops are being given legal counsel. You don't want to be on the hook for this in case, you know, a pastor says, well, I'll let 10 people into the church and somebody gets sick. Maybe that's the, the precaution here. But if you're talking about a car, as the, the next pastor will, will, will introduce you to, he's, he's implemented this and it's working beautifully, as you'll see in a moment. President Trump said this on Wednesday, Janet, I want you to listen. My biggest disappointment is that churches can't meet in a time of need. You know, this is really a great time for churches to be together, for people to get together on a Sunday or whenever, any day and meet. And yet, if you do that, if you do it close, you're really giving this invisible enemy a very big advantage. So uh, it's, it's the biggest, I think, the single biggest disappointment. Uh, you know, Janet, do you think the administration and the state government should be granting waivers or carve-outs for churches, assuming they social distance? Absolutely. It, it seems to me that they tend to think of religion, again, as just some sort of social event, like a sporting event. It's not mm -hmm. that, right? This is the deepest part of our being. We think that we live in order to worship. 
all right? So yes, living is extremely important, but the purpose of our living is to worship, and you're taking away our very purpose. Again, mm-hmm. if it were if it were in fact um, uh, uh, truly risking people's lives, we would not ask for this. But people yeah, and, are- and, and let's lay out briefly, Janet, what are you asking the bishops in this letter, which has been signed by a slew of Catholic leaders? Run through some of the requests here. Well, well some of the requests I mean, simply is, is to try their hardest to make certain that they, we can get of the sacraments that in ways that um, honor the directives. And you might say, oh, well, they're trying to do that. But we have, tell us that, show us that, and make an explanation mm-hmm. about why you decided to do X, Y, or Z. And then, uh, for instance, they have dispensed us all from going to mass on Sunday. But what does that really mean? What I mean, mm-hmm. people are watching it on TV. Does that count in some sense? Is is it, is it is there something else we should be doing? Do the bishop saying, well, you know, if you can't go to mass, which you can't on Sunday, unless it's in a car in a mm-hmm. parking lot, which you're perfectly safe, <laughs> this is what you should be doing to sustain your spiritual life. I want them to be giving us explanations and directives, explanations on why they're doing what they're doing. And I hope that their intention is that they're sitting around brainstorming with everybody to say, how can we make certain that those who want to be baptized get baptized without risking anybody's lives? How do we make mm-hmm. certain that confessions heard? How do we make certain that people can go to mass and adoration? I mean, even if it's, a, I've, I've seen pictures of, of a bishop outside of a church with the monstrance and a pray do, and he's praying yeah. there with the monstrance, and people are driving by or parking their cars in the parking lot and doing adoration. This is not the same thing as watching something on TV. We are people I of the agree inc- with you. We're people of the incarnation. You know, if you go to a mass of four million people in the Philippines when the Holy Father comes, you don't much see the Pope. He is so far away, you don't see him. But, you know, you are there in a more meaningful way than the someone who is sitting at home and sees a close-up of the Pope on at the altar. We believe yeah. that being physically present matters. And um, so we want that. We want, if we can do it safely, and I just yeah. can't see that it can be done safely. Yeah, well, Janet, I, I, the, the thing that worries me is the, the cultural uh, analysis here, which is if you begin to acclimate people to compartmentalizing their faith somewhere between The Price is Right and Netflix, I worry <laughs> that it becomes a kind of dial-up religion that when it's over, you just click it off and it's contained to the screen and they won't show up next Sunday. When this thing lifts in a month from now, two months from now, I mean, my personal belief is, we, we, you know, we could be talking uh, eight more weeks here of quarantine for the country or parts of the country. What happens during that time? Holy Week at home, basically. I think you've got to make extraordinary efforts as you would in wartime. We keep talking about wartime. If this is wartime, act like it's wartime. And in wartime, you had heroic priests on the bow of ships, uh, in the battlefield. We need, as the Pope said early on, we need the field hospital. Where is the field hospital at this point? Field hospital seems to be absent in the Catholic sense. You know, it's this, and again, with the anointing of the sick, that's the most serious one to me. We can we can live mm-hmm. without the, the Blessed Sacrament, but we shouldn't be dying without the Blessed Sacrament. And if nurses mm-hmm. and doctors go into these wards with their full equipment and, and, and feel reasonably safe, uh, I know I have a picture on, on Facebook of one of my former students who was a priest now. He's got the whole personal protective equipment, and then he goes in to anoint uh, patients. Some doctors, mm-hmm. some, some uh, Bishop Tobin and, and Cardinal Tobin is uh, dropping uh, permission to, he's denying permission to anoint the sick. And I want to say instead he should be calling every hospital and saying, we insist upon this. Again, this is not bringing flowers to the dead. This is bringing something that is incredibly essential to this person. This person is a Catholic, mm-hmm. and this person has practiced their faith and wants to practice their faith up to the last minute of their time on right. the face of this. And it, it, I agree. It can be- I, I don't know what could be, I don't know what could be more important, Janet, and I, I, I with you, I worry. You know, the Wuhan virus came to the United States and the world, and it has transformed us all into Chinese Catholics in many ways, underground. Everything's underground now. 
and 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 I do worry. There, and there are exceptions to this. We had Bishop Strickland here last week. There are bishops in the Midwest. My next guest, Bishop, they are making uh, uh, creative accommodations to try to find ways to, within safety, with it, with an eye to public safety, reach the faithful with the sacraments. And that's their job. Have you heard from any bishops as a result of this campaign and this open letter? No, and I, in a certain sense, I don't expect to. But what I, what, <laughs> this is, I mean, we're Catholics are, are creatures of hope, and I, am full of hope, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a fantasy, uh, but I believe in the miraculous. I, I would just love to hear, have the bishop say, you know, thank you, thank you, and thank Raymond Arroyo, and thank all these people who are trying to um, help. Uh, we're lay people, and we're trying to help. We're not trying to use this as an opportunity to, to slam the bishops one more time. We're trying to say, yep. bishops, these these are our spiritual needs, right? You yep. are the ones who are responsible. And I'm, I'm just hoping some bishop somewhere will say, you know, thank you. Uh, you know, we're so busy with so many things. This is great to have this degree of feedback from very thoughtful Catholics who have, have laid this out for us, who have gotten all these other names to get our attention. It's hard to get our attention because we're busy with all these things. Yep. You send a letter, you make a phone call, it's not going to be answered. You put up an yeah. open letter that gets 10,000, 20,000, 40,000 signatures, I hope. We're going to pay a little bit of attention. And and, and we're not, we don't yeah. take this as adversarial. We take this as no. we're in cooperative no, discernment this is, this, on how this to is an when I read this, I thought this is an urgent spiritual need that you are setting on, on paper. It's an urgent spiritual need. And I'm not sure because it's a moment of crisis, because you even have bishops who are ill with this thing, this COVID-19. I, I think everybody's topsy-turvy and a little, a little off balance. But I can tell you, as I read your letter, as, I, as I'm watching what's playing out across the country, I thought, I wanted to have you here because if Mother Angelica were around today, I can promise you almost with certainty that she would be <laughs> urging more sacraments for more people in this dire moment. That is the medicine, the spiritual medicine needed perhaps more than any other at this moment. And that will fortify our people on the front lines, our doctors, our nurses to continue in what is a hard and awful battle. But you need the spiritual sustenance or you will just wither. So the letter is we are an Easter people Dot com. You can find it there. That's the open letter that Dr. Smith was talking about. Keep in touch with us. Let us know uh, what the reaction is in the days ahead, Janet. Great. Thanks for having us on and thanks for the support. Ingenuity. That is what Catholics and all people of faith seem to want most when it comes to the sacraments. A priest in Oklahoma has instituted drive-up masses. Here to explain his vision is pastor of St. Monica's Catholic Church in the Diocese of Oklahoma City, Father Stephen Hamilton. Father, thanks for being with us. Great to be with you, Raymond. Now, Father, were the masses in your diocese canceled when you came up with this idea to have these drive-up masses? So the masses were, the public masses anyways, were suspended. Uh, that was announced mm -hmm. on March 17th. So I began uh, thinking right away in that first week what I would do leading up to the first weekend, which was Sunday, uh, March 22nd. Hmm. And, and what was your ordinary Archbishop Coakley's response to this request to have essentially drive-in masses? Right. Well, I, I called him up to ask him about the idea. I, I assured him that it would be done reverently and appropriately, and that was a, certainly a big concern of his, uh, and that we would do the best we could to keep it orderly and to uh, observe certain precautions like social distancing. So with those uh, things in play, he was very supportive of the creativity. No, when I read about this and I talked about it elsewhere, um, I, I was I was really impressed. I think it's something others should do because I've seen the outdoor adoration. Uh, I've seen the drive through confessions. This right. is novel. And you don't have communion, though, correct? That is correct. So because of the inability to kind of mingle and be... That was one of the stipulations is that we would not be able to distribute Holy Communion, but would have to explain and encourage spiritual communion. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, some of the, the uh, evangelical churches are having outdoor services as well. They have pre-sanitized communion packets, but uh, a pastor was explaining to me this week that's not possible in Catholic worship. 
Right. So that that's not possible for us, and we're we're not doing that. But we're encouraging people to remember the grace of the spiritual communion, which perhaps this is an as odd as the as the circumstances are, an opportunity to really kind of relearn that uh, standard Catholic practice. So yeah, the mm -hmm. prepackaged pack uh, kits for Holy Communion are not possible for us, and we're not certainly not doing that. Even if you put them on the altar and consecrated them all at once. Well, I suppose I would have to distribute them appropriately, though, and that would then become the problem. Ah. Okay. Now, you had full p parking lots for these masses. How many, uh, what are people saying, first of all, and how many people participated last weekend? Yeah, so I, I think um, the, my setup at my campus here is is rather ideal for this because my parking lots, you just kind of imagine that almost like an amphitheater in front of the main entrance to the church. So that doesn't necessarily imply that everyone has a great line of sight, but they can be in the front of the church where I've set up the altar uh, and uh, the parking lots have, have been full. Um, I would just estimate at least, you know, somewhere around 700 people, I would think, uh, based on the number of cars and, and the number of people probably in each car. Uh, the response has been incredible, both from my own parishioners and people I know are coming from other parishes uh, in the area. Uh, and it really? just really kind of all started in those first days after the public masses were suspended of hearing from people and my interactions with them, the kind of the different reactions to this notion and how disorienting it is to not be able to attend mass. So uh, confusion, sadness, uh, depression, even anger. Yeah. And it just caused me to think about what can I do to at least bring the mass closer to the people in some fashion. Are other, are other priests mimicking your innovation here? I mean, when I read about this, when I saw the video, I thought, why isn't every parish that can do it? Obviously, city parishes, this would be more difficult. But suburban parishes with big parking lots, why couldn't they do this? Why couldn't they offer multiple masses a day? Well, it's it's certainly an idea, and and um, there are not other parishes locally that I'm aware of doing this. But again, what I would emphasize is that really my setup here, as far as the plant, is really ideal. Whereas other parishes in our area that I know of, you know, they have smaller parking lots, and this one's kind of scattered in various areas. It just would be difficult to pull off. But I have this really nice setup, at least for us, um, in that the parking lots kind of fan out in front of the church, and then in the front of the front doors of the church is what I call the piazza. It's just this open area, and so I'm mm -hmm. able to put the altar there and, 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 and function in that way. So I, I'm really in an ideal place for this to work here. Now, some parishes are offering drive-up confession, drive-up ways of the cross in the, in the lead-up to Holy Week. Are you doing that as well? I have not moved to drive up confessions yet. So we're, we're having confessions in the main church to allow greater distancing between people and hearing confessions uh -huh. behind a screen only. So right now we're still doing that. Um, I'm aware of those creative ideas out there of having drive up confessions. I haven't started that myself, although I do know a few other parishes uh, in our archdiocese mm -hmm. here where some priests are doing that or other versions of it where people come up maybe to a window outside of the office perhaps and walk up to confession. But a lot of those right. creative ideas are out here too. What are, you, what are you hearing from uh, parishioners? I mean, I, I have to tell you, as I stay in contact with friends or I see them at the coffee shop with my mask on, uh, there is a, a real yearning to get back to normalcy. And part of that is having our daily and Sunday worship in place. I mean, they want the mass. They want the Eucharist. Right. Uh, what are you advising and what would you advise your brother priests and bishops to do, given this circumstance and the yearning from the people, trying to balance those two needs between public safety and the right to administer the sacraments? Certainly, it's a great question. Uh, and I think uh, my encouragement would be that we want to observe what are the uh, precautions that need to be taken, uh, like social distancing. And in my case, for the outdoor mass in our parking lot, I clearly instruct people repeatedly, they must stay in their cars. That's the one major condition for this to go forward. Ah. Um, I think that we want to continue to observe those precautions, but do what we can to try to bring uh, the, the sacraments as close as we can to the people. And I know that's a real yearning for folks. It's what I heard from my yep. own people in that first week. And it's what motivated me from a, a pastor's heart to try something um, that was unusual for me and unusual for all of us, but better than than not having the ability to come to Mass I at agree. all. So I just would encourage yeah. my brother priests and, and bishops out there to, to observe the necessary precautions, because that's key uh, for health reasons, mm -hmm. but also to try to find ways where you have a setup, like perhaps mine is, where you can do something creative outside and let mm -hmm. people still come and, and close. Well, Father, we thank you for your creativity, for your ministry, and happy birthday. I'm told it's your birthday. <laughs> thank you. That's right. It's a, it's a birthday in quarantine. 
Oh, uh, well, we're, that, that's how we're celebrating all of them right now. Uh, what are you that's doing right. for, for Good Friday before I let you go? Well, so it, as of now, I'm planning to do the Sacred Triduum outdoors as well. Uh, and we'll have the Good Friday service out in front of the church. I'm planning to do that at 3 p.m. Uh, since people are kind of out of school and things, we'll be able to kind of do that at that normally preferred time of 3 p.m. So as of now, the plan is outdoors for that. Father Stephen Hamilton, thank you for being with us and uh, and and for your inspiration. I, I think it's a, I hope it's it's an example a lot of bishops and priests look at, particularly as we go into Holy Week. Uh, this is people feel so abandoned and with everything turned upside down, they need the solidity and surety of faith. And this is a great way, I think, to to share it with them. So thank you, Father. We'll be in touch. Thanks, Raymond. Thank you. Congressman Brian Stile is up next, but first, some more news. After some delay, the Catholics for Trump coalition launched this week. A rally in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, originally scheduled for March 19th, was postponed due to the coronavirus pandemic. Mercedes Schlapp, the senior advisor for strategic communications for the Trump campaign, said in a statement, quote, President Trump is a steadfast supporter of the Catholic community and has delivered on his promises. She went on to tout everything from his appointment of conservative judges to his religious liberty record to stopping money going to Planned Parenthood. Initially skeptical of candidate Trump in 2016, the president won the vote of self-identified Catholics by a margin of 52 percent to 45 percent. And just last week, Congress passed the coronavirus stimulus bill, the largest aid package in American history. It provides essential relief to American workers in an economy reeling from the COVID-19 crisis. The $2 trillion stimulus bill provides direct payments to the American people and emergency loans, but it also did something else. The bill included outrageous expenditures of hundreds of millions of dollars for items totally unrelated to the pandemic. Joining me now to discuss how some of these questionable items remained in the bill, his proposal to rescind the appropriation made to the Kennedy Center and much more, a member of the House Financial Services Committee, Congressman Brian Stile of Wisconsin. Congressman, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me on. Congressman Stile, was there much argument in the House over this Kennedy Center grant, this $25 million grant, on top of the $44 million plus they already receive annually? You know, so we didn't get to a, a bring forth any amendments uh, at all on the CARES Act. So we're spending $2 trillion. Uh, it was an up or down vote. Americans were in need. Mm. We needed to make sure we're protecting people uh, who needed to cover their rent, cover their mortgage, pay their grocery bills, make sure that our medical professionals had the resources they need to be able to fight the virus. But buried inside yeah. this was a pet project, the $25 million for the Kennedy Center. Uh, I spoke about it on the House floor uh, the day we passed this uh, last Friday. Uh, but now, mm -hmm. after we see what the Kennedy Center did by laying people off, uh, we're, we're gaining attention uh, for the bill that I introduced. Yeah, and let's tell people about that. Deborah Rutter, who's the director at the Kennedy Center, she is not paying the musicians there, the National Symphony Orchestra, despite the $25 million in welfare. So the question is, you know, the orchestra is told they're going to lose their health care. Uh, and we're talking about a group, the Kennedy Center, that's sitting on a $100 million endowment. Wasn't the relief money supposed to or purportedly set aside for workers? Well, what's so appalling is the Kennedy Center got to jump to the front of the line. They got a mm. sweetheart deal that no other entity got. And so they got a specific line item in the bill for $25 million. And then after they get that, they go and lay off their employees. And exactly what you said, they got to be looking for additional resources from themselves right. before they come for a sweetheart deal from the federal government. It's amazing to me. I mean, with the endowment that they group and the annual that they receive and the annual uh, uh, appropriation from the federal government, how much do they get each year, Congressman? I, uh, my calculation, it looks upwards of 44 million, but there's so many grants and so many little honeypots, it's hard to keep track. It's, it's hard to keep track, uh, but what was so appalling is in a bill that was put together to address the coronavirus, to make sure right. that we're protecting workers uh, who've fallen on hard times, to make sure nurses and doctors have protective equipment. They were able mm. to get a line item, a sweetheart deal, to get to the front of the line uh, for the Kennedy Center, a theater in Washington, D.C., 
people here in Wisconsin who are struggling with the <laughs> coronavirus are rightfully upset. And that's why we're working to yeah. take this money back. Well, look, I loved the Kennedy Center, but I lived in Northern Virginia. But why should the rest of the country finance our theater going? It's ridiculous. These are also, by the way, some of the most expensive and wealthy counties in America around D.C. They can afford their own theater tickets. They don't need welfare. Here's my question. You have a bill or you're proposing a bill that would rescind this money from the Kennedy Center. How much support are you receiving? And is it all from Republicans? You know, as we got to the start of this week and people realized what the Kennedy Center did after they got the $25 million, we started getting phone calls left and right of people wanting to sign up. So far, it's been mm -hmm. all Republicans, but I look at this, there's no reason this should be partisan. This is an issue where yeah. one entity got a sweetheart deal. They got to cut the line in front of everybody else. This is a moment mm -hmm. where we should band together and take this money back. Yeah. I want to run through some of the other organizations that were funded under, remember, a coronavirus relief bill, $10 billion for international uh, development, $350 million for refugee resettlement, $93 million for Congress, $25 million of which is for salaries and expenses, $75 million for PBS and NPR. $75 million for the National Foundation on the Arts and Humanities. $75 million for the National Endowment for the Humanities. $50 million for the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And $7,500,000 for the Smithsonian Institution. Now, many of these are already federally run, federally financed programs, Congressman. That's almost $12 billion listed there. Why are you focusing all your attention on rescinding the money from the Kennedy Center? Shouldn't these other groups be rescinded as well? These other expenditures? Nope. I'm, I'm all about looking at every single one of them. Uh, this bill was directly at the Kennedy Center. I am all about continuing that we are advocates for taxpayers. This money should be going to either fight the coronavirus, protect workers who are laid off, or back in taxpayers' pockets. Uh, I think mm -hmm. we're just beginning the process of going back and looking at what happens when a $2 trillion bill gets rushed through. We need to be focused in to make sure that this money is well spent spent to protect workers, fight the coronavirus, or otherwise should be in taxpayers' pockets. Mm -hmm. Now, President Trump said this about the next coronavirus relief bill, which I can hardly believe we're talking about. Watch. We have a zero interest rate, essentially. And I said, wouldn't this be a great time to borrow money at zero interest rate and really build our infrastructure like we can do it? Now, Congressman Speaker Pelosi on Monday told reporters in a conference call that she's already looking uh, at new, a new round of coronavirus relief legislation. But Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell does not seem to be in much of a hurry to start phase four. Let's see how things are going and respond accordingly. But let's not I'm not going to allow this to be an opportunity for the Democrats uh, to achieve unrelated policy items that they would not otherwise be able to pass. Congressman, you serve on the Financial Services Committee. The stimulus package is $2 trillion, and the expectation is the economy will recover from this setback due to the coronavirus. Can we afford another $2 trillion worth of spending on, on coronavirus relief? We need to make sure that any money we spend is fact-driven, that it's addressing the problems that we're actually having and not funding sweetheart deals. And so my concern uh, is in this fourth coronavirus package is that Nancy Pelosi is going to walk in with a wish list of projects that she's going to want to spend on that is not going to be related to mm -hmm. workers that are suffering, not going to be related to actually fighting the coronavirus for our doctors and our nurses on the front lines. And that's my biggest concern. Speaker Pelosi has appointed a coronavirus, her own task force, her House Select Committee on the Coronavirus Crisis. Now, she claims it's going to be bipartisan and that its goal will be, and I'm going to read this, she wants to make sure that the money, the money that's already been spent and the money to be spent, will be going to working families struggling to pay rent. The panel will root out waste, fraud, and abuse. Do you believe that? Yeah, you know, it's hard to think that they're going to weed out waste, fraud, and abuse. Nancy Pelosi flew back uh, to Washington, D.C., to insert special projects into the third coronavirus bill that took days to negotiate back out. And we still ended up with things like the Kennedy Center funding. So I'm very concerned of what Nancy Pelosi is going to try to get into any future bills. We should read them carefully. 
This is a time where we need to be making sure we're protecting workers, we're fighting the coronavirus. This should not be an opportunity for people to put in their spe special pet projects that get to the front of the line. What do you say to those congressmen? I'm going to leave you with this. Uh, they say Republicans got $25 billion in grants. They got $25 billion in loans to the airline industry, a series of regulatory changes sought by the banking industry. So the Democrats got a couple of sweetheart deals and, and money for the Kennedy Center. That's the price of Democratic support for this bill. That's not the way that we should be doing. That's politics as usual. And that's what makes people so frustrated at home here mm -hmm. who are actually suffering the impacts of the coronavirus. They're suffering from losing jobs. They're suffering from being sick or having loved ones who are sick. And that is what makes people sick when they hear that that's the politics as usual in Washington. We need to be fact driven. Mm. We need to fight the virus. We need to protect workers. But this is not a time for sweetheart deals. Congressman Stile, uh, the Democratic uh, National Committee has come out. They've announced they are delaying their national convention till August. Your thoughts on should the Republicans respond in kind, or is this an effort to use, if you will, the coronavirus pandemic to distort or shift our election season and the, the pending uh, presidential election? Yeah, you know, I don't know what was in the thought making uh, of the Democratic leaders who are shifting the date of their convention. Uh, but I do know when we get to the end of this and we look and we say, who do we want to be the leader uh, for the next four years? The track record of President Trump uh, in the disastrous policies that the Democrats are putting forward is going to make that decision very clear for people, regardless of when the Democrats actually hold their convention. Congressman, I thank you so much for being with us. We'll check in with you. As the days go Thanks on. for having me on. Be safe. The state of Texas will be allowed to enforce a temporary ban on nearly all abortions during the coronavirus pandemic for the time being. This according to a ruling by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which overturned a federal judge's decision earlier this week that put a hold on the ban, claiming it would cause irreparable harm to patients. Texas Governor Greg Abbott put the abortion ban in place last week in an effort to curb the spread of the virus and free up medical resources to treat it. Planned Parenthood and the Center for Reproductive Rights are appealing that decision. Joining me now to discuss the Texas case and how it might affect a battle brewing over abortion in Louisiana is attorney and associate director of Louisiana Right to Life, Angie Thomas. Angie, thanks for being with me. Uh, we'll talk about the implications of that Texas ruling in a moment, but I want to start with a group called June Medical Services. Uh, it's an abortion provider in Louisiana. Now, the Department of Louisiana Health banned elective non-emergency procedures in the state. So why is June Medical Services defying that order? How are they getting away with this? Right, Raymond. It's just shameful. It's it's their their reckless uh, just pursuit of abortion on demand, and it needs to stop. Well, there there are two other abortion providers in Louisiana that have complied. Why is June Medical the outlier here? Well, as we've seen in the past years, June Medical. Uh, tends to uh, defy the orders and laws. So you might remember June Medical Services from the Supreme Court case that uh, oral arguments were just, just heard last month at the U.S. Supreme Court level. Uh, June mm -hmm. Medical Services did not want to comply with Louisiana law, common sense legislation about admitting privileges. So here again, June Medical mm -hmm. Services is putting profits over patients and truly endangering women and our whole society. Now, what happens now if a woman has complications during or after an abortion and the doctor does not have admitting privileges at a nearby hospital? Well, that patient is uh, admitted into the ER and another doctor is has to assess the patient, which is very difficult but because they don't know mm -hmm. what has been going on with that patient. And so mm -hmm. here again, uh, in this global pandemic where everyone is uh, is changing the way they live, you know, June Medical Services is business as usual. So if they have a, a, a patient that is admitted to the ER, that will be a very difficult situation for the healthcare systems to deal with at this time. But, but Angie, I'm confused, and I think uh, other, and I'm here in Louisiana, and I'm sure other people watching are confused. 
how is this group, if in Texas you have the Fifth Circuit overturning that lower court ruling and it's allowing Texas to enforce a ban on elective procedures, including abortion, why is June Services allowed to do this in Louisiana when, when the attorney general and, and the governor have already come out against this? Right. It's, it's, a, it's a very interesting situation where they are just simply defying the orders. And uh, we just did find out today that the abortion clinic in Baton Rouge just reopened today. So they had been closed for the past two mm. weeks, but just found out that they reopened as well. So um, they're claiming that abortion is essential. Um, but certainly uh -huh. the, the wording in Louisiana, especially our Department of Health issued guidelines that stated that the only medical and surgical procedures allowed are those that treat emergency medical conditions. Well, certainly mm -hmm. abortion as an elective procedure would not qualify. And, you know, the, okay. the other part here is that they're using very scarce personal protective equipment, and they're, they're taking that mm -hmm. from the people who really need it in the ER. Okay, but you've got the Fifth Circuit ruling, for Fifth Circuit Court ruling now. Um, why can't Louisiana invoke that and go enforce the, the ban? Well, right now, we're really, it's a wait and see. The, the Fifth Circuit issued a temporary stay, allowing mm -hmm. the Texas to continue while the case uh, continues through the process. So really, we, mm -hmm. we are waiting to see what the Fifth Circuit is going to do here. Okay. Pro-choice abortion activists say this is just an opportunistic attempt to block women from their health care, health care they're entitled to in a time of crisis. Is it? Well, it's just a shame to see how abortion advocates continue to just put women at risk. The narrative is that they, uh, abortion becomes an exception to all of the rules, that they don't have to play by the rules. But here we are in a global pandemic. Everyone is affected. And the abortion clinics need to comply with these guidelines just like everyone else. Okay, but Angie, you're asking them to comply. There's a ban in place. So what are you actually asking? Do you want the authorities to go in and shut these clinics down? Are you asking the governor to send, send officers over there? W what are you all actually asking? It seems you've already got a ban in place. They're defying it. Why aren't officers going in? Right. It's, it's fascinating. I think it's because the resources are so scarce. All of our government officials are putting all of their resources into fighting this pandemic. Louisiana is such mm -hmm. a hot spot. And interestingly right. enough, you know, of course, New Orleans is a hot spot, but Shreveport, where June Medical Services has continued to defy this order for, for several weeks now, uh, that, that's becoming a real hot spot. And, and Raymond, they have mm. one, one eyewitness said that there were over 20 people who walked in with their, uh, with people walking with them, women walking in before lunch. So this is mm. it's business as usual at June Medical Services. Well, so and, and again, if if churches are non-essential, but this is so these people can congregate with abandon. Look, here in New Orleans, the, the, the mayor is sending out officers to break up groups of 10 or more congregating on a street corner. So clearly this is running afoul of public safety bans at this point. That is correct. Yes. And putting okay. women and really their own staff at risk. So what we're asking mm. is a lot of medical professionals are, are looking at this and they are writing the Louisiana State Board of Medical Examiners. There's also um, mm. been a lot of letters written to the governor. But again, they're, the, the governor and the Department of Health are really very busy right now. And so why is the abortion clinic continuing to just shamefully defy these guidelines? We just don't know. And we just pray well, that. So, so this is in Bell Edwards' hands. This is in John Bell Edwards' hands, who, who, who ran as a pro-life governor. Um, I guess this is a chance to, to see for real what he's, what he's made of. Uh, Angie, I thank you for bringing this to our attention, and we'll check in in the days ahead. Thank you, Raymond. Finally tonight, she has spent over three decades practicing pediatric and adolescent medicine and counseling teens and parents. She's here tonight to discuss... The challenges and pressures I think we're all facing as we power through this coronavirus pandemic. How can we best avoid the virus and maintain our mental health and our sanity while in quarantine? Here with some helpful tips is Dr. Meg Meeker.
Meg, thanks for being here. Uh, on Wednesday, oh, President Trump was asked about the pros and cons of people sheltering at home for a long period of time and the rise of domestic violence. Watch. It's another cost of, uh, of not getting our country working. I mean, people are — now, some people are getting along great. I've also had the, op the exact opposite question. People, families are coming together. They're actually coming together. They haven't talked for a long time, and now all of a sudden they're talking again. They're loving each other. So I've heard that, too. But I also have heard domestic violence much, you know, at a higher level. And drug use because of, in this case, they'd lose their jobs. Dr. Meeker, are you seeing this in your practice or locally, a rise in domestic abuse and drug use stemming from this quarantine? You know, we're not seeing as much uh, domestic violence. We're seeing some anxiety that's pretty bad in kids mm. and adults. But um, really, I'm seeing a lot of that, but not domestic violence. Mm -hmm. School districts across the country have switched to distance learning. Many parents are struggling with telework, homeschooling, the stress of everyone on top of each other. What is your advice to parents at home who are feeling a little frayed, let us say? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think it's really important to get everybody in the home on a schedule. You know, when things turn mm. upside down, kids aren't in school, mom and dad aren't working anymore, whatever. I think that we sort of let things go into a free-for-all, and we can't do that. It's really important for kids and parents to maintain some kind of schedule to keep their sanity. We all need a rhythm and a balance to our day, and I think that losing control of a schedule really sometimes can put people over the edge. That is such great advice. Now, we, you know, our kids, because of the schools initially, they have to check in in the morning and they start their virtual classes, all three of them. So that kind of gets everybody moving because then you've got to have breakfast and you have to have lunch and dinner at the appointed times. And I'm still working. So uh, it, it, yeah. it does keep everybody on point and I think moving through the day, feeling they've accomplished something, too. Now, with the quarantine in place, there's no school after school soccer or dance class or music lessons. How should parents look at the extra time with their families? What are some tips for parents to focus on the positive and really make use of this time set apart? I mean, we've never had time like this, Meg. No, we haven't. And some people are really stressed out and some parents are really embracing it. I think it's important mm -hmm. um, to, to empathize with your kids and say, if you have a senior in high school, you know, I'm really sorry you can't finish the soccer season or the, or the basketball mm -hmm. season, whatever they're doing. So empathize. Then I tell mm -hmm. to parents and their kids, look, come together and tell everybody where we need to come together and do the best we can. I'm all about adding chores and work for kids during the day as well to keep them mm -hmm. occupied. It's also important for everybody to get outside if they possibly can. Get some fresh air. Yep. No, we've we've taken up biking in the Arroyo household, which I, I frankly <laughs> haven't done since they were little kids. You know, I'm on the bike yeah. again. It's nice. Are you concerned yeah. about the extra screen time that not only our children, but all of us are consuming? How do you balance that during this COVID quarantine? Well, again, I think that you work screen time into your daily schedule. You know, you don't want your 17-year-old boy sitting in his room with his laptop or phone uh, looking at whatever he's looking at all day. So it's really important, even if you have older kids, to say, OK, from four to six, you can have screen time. But it's very important for parents to know what are they watching in that screen time? What are they doing? We tend to get a little bit lax about that as parents because we're tired and we just don't want to deal with it. But it's still really important to, A, schedule their, their screen time and, B, know what they're watching. It's very, very important. Mm. How should parents talk to children, particularly young children, about this virus? Because you were mentioning earlier people are anxious. You don't want to provoke more anxiety. Uh, yeah. How do you reassure them? I think it's important, first of all, for parents to get hold of their anxiety, because if you're anxious when you talk to your kids, it doesn't matter what you say, they're going to pick up on it. So it's important to really quell a child's anxiety by saying, you know what, it's a tough time, our lives have changed, but we're going to be okay. And you really can realistically mm -hmm. say that to your kids, because the truth is over 95% of us are going to survive this. Kids in particular are going to do better than adults because it seems so far to be an adult disease. Yeah.
Yeah, and I, I also, um, I love the idea that when you're spending, kids really just want to spend more time with you as a parent. Yeah. They, 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 uh, our kids and, and our friends have been telling us, you know, it's amazing how they want to cocoon. They want to be near you. Yeah. They want to go out and do things with you. Uh, but how do you maintain a sense of normalcy amid a situation that is anything but and could drag on for months here? And what's the role of prayer in all this, Meg? Oh my, prayer is huge. It's interesting, I'm writing an ebook for Regnery right now and I have a whole section on prayer. Prayer is extremely important because A, it brings us before God. It, it allows God to come into our lives, to focus on God and to ask him for help. Because the truth of the matter is God wants that from us and he wants us to come to him and he will aid us. So it's very important again to sort of factor some prayer time into your day. I will tell you, Raymond, my experience is that kids are doing a lot better with this sort of um, being stuck in the home with their parents, better than parents are. Because as you I say, agree. kids do want more time with their parents and they're not getting enough. What do you say to those who are struggling mightily with the job loss and that sense of identity that they feel they're losing in the midst of all of this? Boy, I'm seeing a lot of that. And one of the things I, th I see is that, you know, fathers in particular and mothers who have a big part of their identity in their profession to say, you know what, that's not the sum of who you are. So you need to put that aside a little bit and embrace the part of you that's the parent, that's the father, that is something different and ask God to help you with that. Financially, again, it can be really hard and you just have to you know, rein it in and spend less. And that's a good thing really for parents to do. Mm. What's your advice to moms and dads and how they can care for themselves so they can better care for their children? It is tough yeah. being in such tight confines. I mean, unless you have a, you know, an enormous house where everybody can go to their corners and then, you know, come together. Uh, it, it, it's, it's difficult. It is very hard. I say, you know, find the thing very specifically that's causing you anxiety. Is it your job loss? Is it the kids mm -hmm. driving you crazy? Is it the, the relationships in the home? And then once you identify that stress, find a way to relieve it. And again, work mm -hmm. that into your day. Some people are uh, find relief in their stress through exercise, some through quiet, some through music. Mm -hmm. And so say to your kids, you know what, mom or dad, we need 45 minutes or an hour now to separate ourselves and go do something. So don't feel that you need to be on top of your kids all the time. It's perfectly fine to isolate yourself for a little bit during the day and do what you need to do to relieve your stress. It's very important for parents to do. Yeah, particularly when you're working in the home and you've got, so you brought in some ways the work stress into the home environment yes. rather than having it outside. So you do have to uh, curtail that. That's a bit of a balancing act, I think, for all of us. It is. And working at home can be very difficult for parents when they have small kids at home. And again, I think it's really important to work something out where mom and dad sort of, um, you know, balance that, you know, one will say, I'm going to work now. And then the other will say, I work now. And then they right. trade off with the kids. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Dr. Meg Meeker, thank you for being here. Uh, Dr. Meg's most recent book, Raising a Strong Daughter in a Toxic Culture, is available at bookstores and everywhere online. And it's a great time to read it. You can also follow her commentary at meekerparenting.com. Thank you, Dr. Meg. Thank you, Raymond. Before we go, some sad news. Jazz icon and New Orleans musical patriarch Ellis Marsalis passed away Wednesday. The 85-year-old pianist had been hospitalized with symptoms of coronavirus. He was tested but was awaiting results. The patriarch of the Marcellus family was a fixture of the jazz scene in New Orleans for decades, but he was perhaps best known as a teacher of a generation of jazz musicians, including Harry Connick Jr., Terrence Blanchard, and his sons, Winton, Branford, Delphio, and Jason. I interviewed Ellis a few years ago where he had this to say about the importance of teaching the next generation. What is the secret, if there is a secret, to training a master musician, a musician that can really stand out? Well, I don't know that it's, it's fair to put that totally on me with the training. When I was teaching at NOCA, uh, all of the students, with the exception of the drummers, was studying privately with somebody. 
But for the most part, the whole concept is, is, is not so much a secret, but a respect for excellence. The city of New Orleans is heartbroken. Along with jazz fans everywhere, our prayers go out to the entire Marcellus family. Ellis is survived by his six sons. May Ellis Marcellus rest in peace. And I've been heartened by the letters and emails I've gotten from families reading the Will Wilder books over the last few weeks. I love that you're enjoying the adventure together. One of the themes of the series is how older and younger generations rely on each other and how together they can take on whatever lies ahead. The paperback edition of Will Wilder 3, The Amulet of Power, is now in bookstores and online. All three Will Wilder books are available as audio books as well as on Kindle. Go to willwilderbooks.com or visit my Facebook and Twitter pages for more details. Happy reading. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. That's all the time we have for you now. Be safe, stay together, and be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from New Orleans. Bye now.